you I've sailed since an early age and uh, during my time as a delivery skipper I completed four transatlantic trips, although I have to say not as yet as part of the ARC, so if anybody's got a spare berth let me know. Um, but perhaps more importantly for the last eight years I've been involved with the pre-departure safety checks in Las Palmas and this has given me a really unique insight into the particular needs of ARC participants. Um, and also some of the more common problems that we, we tend to see in terms of yacht preparation and training. And last year I was fortunate enough to be asked to go out and help in Bali in Australia, which was a real struggle, on the World Arc. Um, so that gave me a really good insight into actually how the events are run away from the normal bases. And that was a real eye-opener. So anybody who wants to talk to me about the World Arc and that part of it, feel free. It was a great experience. Probably the biggest change I've seen over the years um, in the industry has been the amazing leap forwards that equipment has taken in terms of uh, design, price and reliability. And this has often been at the expense of lessons learned in disasters such as the Fastnet or the Sydney Hobart. But technology too has had a, a huge impact on the design of equipment and training uh, compared with even 10 or 15 years ago. Many of you will have uh, read stories of epic survivor and life rafts such as the, the Bailey family who survived 115 days before being rescued by a Korean fishing boat. Living on not much more than rainwater and turtle meat, their story is incredible reading. But with the advance of modern locator beacons and modern equipment such as EPIRBs, hopefully that shouldn't be an experience any of you guys or me need go through. But preparing for the ARC, or any rally in that respect, is about an awful lot more than just going to the Chandri and buying all the latest bits of equipment and all the latest gizmos and surrounding yourself. Um, training is a really, really big part of that, and that's something I want to discuss in this uh, the next 20 minutes or so. So, first of all, why do why do people get training? What's the idea of getting training? Well, I guess for most people choosing to go offshore, they're acutely aware that safety is probably the biggest issue for them. They're likely to be out of the range of immediate rescue from aircraft or lifeboats for certain. So it's more important than ever that you've, you've got the right range of equipment on board, but also that you know how to use that equipment. But equally, you've also got a set of skills and routines that you've practiced and perhaps learned in a training session that will equip you well if things start to go wrong. So certainly safety is one of the main reasons. The other factor when we're offshore, though, is, is being self-reliant. Um, when we're coastal sailing, if something breaks, then it's not normally too much of an issue. We can call in a local harbour and for the price of a small mortgage, we can get a marine engineer to fix it. Sorry, Berthon, that wasn't aimed at Berthon. But, um, <laughs> but when we're offshore, that's slightly different. We need to be able to jury-rig um, something together or even make a permanent repair. And that isn't necessarily just at sea. It's also in some of the more remote parts that you're going to visit, particularly on something like the World Ark. And believe me, having seen the facilities in Bali, you really need to be able to fix things yourself. That's quite important. And that is going to require you to have a much more in-depth knowledge of your boat, its systems, its maintenance, and how the various bits work. I guess the other area, and the other reason people um, start to undertake training, is to improve their current skill levels, and also look at areas that they don't very often use. When we're coastal sailing, it's probably not so important to understand ocean weather routing or ocean weather patterns or some of the trade wind conditions that Jeremy touched on and predicting those. Equally, you might want to perhaps look at learning how, learn how to use a sextant or do some astro navigation. So there are, there are lots of um, areas that we rarely use when we're coastal sailing that perhaps you want to improve and get some training on before we venture offshore. And again, there are lots of courses to help you with that. Oh, I guess the last reason is enjoyment. Um, as with any sport, the more we understand our hobby and our sport, the more enjoyment we get out of it. And also, having prepared as well as we can, we can go offshore feeling a little bit more relaxed and go and really enjoy our time on the water. And after all, that's, that's why we're all there, isn't it? We're there to enjoy ourselves. So lots of reasons. Um, what I want to do is just start by looking at some of the safety demands of offshore sailing and how that may influence some of the training that you may want to get. It's quite hard to see the picture. I don't know if you can quite see, but there's a picture of a boat on its side on a reef there, and I don't want to frighten you all. It does get better. Um, but this is actually a picture of Cork Clipper, which was taking part in the Around the World Rally, I think it's probably about six years ago now. Um, despite, and, and well, you can see, she, it's very hard to see, she founded on a reef, actually, in the Indonesian Ocean. 
Now, despite huge improvement in yacht and equipment design, the accident rate seems to remain stubbornly stable. Well, why is this? Well, the bad news, unfortunately, guys, is that human error is still the prominent reason for things going wrong at sea. And it's certainly what caused Cork Clipper to founder. But equally, the good news is that the human factor and training is the key influencer in deciding the likely outcome of an incident, successful or otherwise. And it was certainly a reasonably successful outcome for Cork Clipper. So what happened? Well, very briefly, they were taking part in the Round the World Rally, as I say, five or six years ago. And this particular reef, Gosang Mampango, was a mark of the course. And Cork Clipper set a waypoint approximately one mile from the reef, quite sensibly, you'd think. They were navigating using the combination of paper charts and electronic charts, but primarily, and we're probably all guilty of this, aren't we, the electronic charts. The paper charts did contain warnings that the positions could be one mile out and that the area was last surveyed 250 years ago, probably in the time of Cook. Um, it also contained warnings that navigational beacons and lights were missing or not working. Unfortunately, on the electronic charts, these warnings weren't so obvious, and this is what they were primarily using. Despite not picking up the Raycon or the uh, navigation light, they carried on their course until ultimately they hit the reef. The plotter was still showing them to be one mile away. So, a really good example of human error. But what's really important here is that the subsequent inquiry went on to really praise the successful way that the skipper of that boat evacuated all the crew and himself very calmly, very safely, in life rafts to other yachts within the race fleet. Nobody was injured, everything was carried out extremely well. And he cited the fact that they'd all completed sea survival training, ISAF offshore training, and critically, a practice routines on their boat for man overboard, flooding, fire, you name it. And they practiced these routines as absolutely key in the successful evacuation. It could have ended up an awful lot worse. So a really good example, you know, of human error, which does happen, and training actually saving the day. Interestingly, as a footnote to that, five of the other yachts behind them would have also hit the reef. They're all on the same course. So what's Cork Clipper got to do with me, you might ask? Well, unlike coastal sailing, ocean sailing does by its very nature require the skipper and the crew to be very independent of outside help. So it's really more important than usual that we have well laid down routines and some really good equipment to rely on. And this picture here, I don't know how well you can see it, is a boat called Pollux. Uh, it's a little Pogo 30 that was taking part in the Ark, I think, two years ago now. And it's an interesting one because I actually spent quite a bit of time talking to these guys in Las Palmas before the start. Because they were a double-handed couple. And anybody that knows the Pogo 30 will know it's quite a sporty little race boat. And I was more concerned that should they have a steering problem, how are they going to manage? Because to try and hand steer with just two of them, this lively little boat across the Atlantic was going to be a bit of a handful. So I went on board and we had a really good chat and they, they thought about a lot of these things already. They'd purchased some extra steering cable to repair their um, quadrant should there be a problem. But they'd also had some additional rigging wire on board and some bulldog clips um, in the event that they had a dismasting or a problem with the mast. Not only that, they'd also thought through um, fire, um, they thought through flooding, they had a good emergency plan with all the hull openings were. They'd thought through man overboard situations, which also you imagine double hand is a big issue. And they'd attended the French um, ISAF course in France as well. So I walked away from the boat thinking, great, I felt much more comfortable, really good example. Anyhow, so it was about, I think, 150 miles outside of um, St. Lucia, having almost got there, they lost the top part of their mast. And as you can see, they did a fantastic jury rig, it's quite hard to see here, but they've actually um, used a windsurfing sail as a temporary head sail. They've managed to use spare rigging wire to, use, to stay what was left of the mast. And also they used the upturned half of the mainsail and made that into a mini mainsail. And they were actually doing five or six knots on this rig and came in, I think, less than 24 hours behind their, behind their finish time. Uh, a really good effort. Um, but again, it's a great example of how you know, these guys had really thought through the problems and come up with some great solutions. Actually came into an amazing round of applause at St. Lucia, you can imagine, they did really well. So, 
it's important when we are offshore, having seen that, that we do think through the possible solutions to any problems we might have. Another big problem on long downwind passages such as the Ark, and most of, as Jeremy touched on, most of the passages tend to be trade wind passages where you're going downwind. And one of the typical problems you find is steering problems. Because you're constantly correcting the steering as you're surfing down waves, it's a very big issue. And you may have read in magazines that it's not uncommon for you have actually been um, abandoned because they've not been able to steer them, which is a real tragedy. So hopefully if it's just a control cable problem, you can, like the guys on Pollux, have some spare cable and fix it yourself. Um, however, if you lose the rudder, you've got slightly more of a problem. But again, it's not impossible. There are various solutions to it. There's a picture here of a couple of solutions. The top one, it's very hard to see, I know, but the top one is a spinnaker pole with the head's door or a locker lid lashed to the end of it. And they've used that as a kind of temporary oar over the back of the boat. Now, anybody that's tried this, I don't know if anybody here has tried it, tried it, it is phenomenally difficult to set up. And what tends to happen is the boat builds up speed, the blade starts to rise out of the water and starts to twist. So trying to brace it and keep it down is difficult. Um, a solution that's been more successful with people is having a, steer, a drogue over the stern of the yacht and that's attached to a bridle and with lines going to either side back to a winch on either side. And by adjusting the lines on the winches you can get some rudimentary steering going downwind. The effect of the drogue is also that it keeps the boat square onto the waves so there's much less chance of surfing and you do tend to be going downwind on most of these passages. So again, just a few little ideas, and the key thing is that we talk about all these things when we do some of the training courses, but it's something to think about. Steering does tend to be a big issue. Increasingly today, as you wander, you'll probably see today as well, as you wander around the boats or go around the boat show, yachts are becoming ever more complicated and sophisticated in terms of the equipment and the electronics on board. And it can, if we're not careful, lead us into a slight false sense of security. One of the downsides of all these systems is that it can be quite interconnected. And we're very electronically reliant. So if one piece of equipment goes down, it can very soon have a major impact on your sailing world. I had a great instructor when I was younger. And uh, when I passed my yacht master years ago, he said to me at the end, you know, the best bit of advice I can give you, Rob, is keep it simple. Keep the water out, keep the crew on the boat, keep the keel down, keep the mast pointing up, and keep the rudder on. Now, I know it sounds basic, but quite honestly, even to this day, that's very true. Try not to be too dazzled by the tinsel of all these electronic gizmos and everything else, and concentrate on the basics. Certainly when you come to equip your boat, think about the structural, the integrity of the yacht, the steering systems, and keep it very basic. Then you can move on to the more advanced things like refrigerators, deep freezes, ice makers and all the other bits and pieces. The other thing we need to do is consider the impact of something not working and do you have any backup systems? Um, for example, do you keep all your navigational eggs in, in one electronic basket as it were? Or do you still maintain a log, a paper log? Do you have a sextant? Do you know how to use it? If the hydraulics went, would you, and you had hydraulic steering, are you still able to steer the yacht to your destination? The electronics failed? Are you still able to raise or lower the mainsail, perhaps if you've got electric winches, or maybe get the anchor up or down? Okay, so not exhaustive. I mean, another problem I heard recently on one event was that um, somebody had a pump on the water tank, not unusual, but they had no manual pump, and when that electric pump went, they weren't able to draw water from the tanks. So simple little things like that. Always, you know, here in the Solent, sailing is not a problem. Offshore, it become a big problem. <laughs> big, big problems. So try and look at the boat through a slightly different set of eyes. You know, I like boats where they've got a pump on the, in the galley, you can pump salt water in, things like that. So, or manual pump from the tank. Little things like that. Don't be dazzled too much by all the electronics. Keep it simple. Now, I mentioned earlier that I've been fortunate enough to um, been involved with the pre-departure safety checks and safety demonstrations in Las Palmas. And this has given me a unique, a unique opportunity to be particularly nosy. I've probably been around 600 boats now, I think. So I've seen quite a lot of things, and it's a real privilege to go onto all these boats. But what you also see is some really good ideas in terms of the way people approach their training, their crew training, and yacht preparation. And just a couple of them here. Um, 
it's very hard to see. We need a big cloud to come over, don't we? Um, but believe me, there's a picture there of a yacht. Um, and what it's a very simple layout plan where everything is, where all the safety equipment is located. And I know that sounds a fairly basic thing to do, but you would be surprised how the simple things don't get done. And quite often when I do a safety inspection, I'll ask a member of crew where, um, I don't know, the bolt croppers are. Um, and I get a shrug, or I'm not sure. I think I saw them when we left Southampton. I can't, where are they? And then there's 20 minutes of frantic digging around lockers and things. So just a very simple location plan can really help. The other thing which I saw, which is great, um, in terms of arranging your crew training and routines, is to have some laminated cards drawn up to cover your emergency procedures. So this one, again, it's quite hard to see, but it's a man overboard procedure. It's very simple. There are four or five bullet points, and it's what to do in the event of a man overboard, who does what. These were posted up on the back of the head door, which I thought was quite nice, because you're not doing much else in there. You may as well read something. So uh, that was a nice little touch. In terms of crew preparation before your, um, your, your voyage, then establish what your crew's current level of knowledge is and arrange for some training uh, to fill those gaps. Do you and the crew have a really good understanding of how you, all your equipment works and how to use it? And certainly have a clear rules on certain safety aspects, such as the wearing of life jackets and lifelines, and most importantly, have a thorough brief before you all go off. Um, it's quite often we're sailing with people we know very well and we can fall into that trap of just assumption um, or assuming, as some may know, assuming makes an arse out of you and me. Um, don't assume that who you're sailing with knows everything on your boat, um, particularly if you have strangers on board as well. Really important to go for a test sail with them first. Make sure A, you like them and B, that they know where everything is and how it all works. The other thing to do in terms of crew preparation is to get out there and practice. Um, go and practice things like man overboard return, but also recovery. And I know Bill, I think, with Mobmat is probably going to show you a little demo later on. It's one thing, we all practice, hopefully, getting back to the victim in the water. How often do we practice getting somebody out of the water? Now, I'm not vindicating that you go out there and start throwing people off into the middle of the Solent, okay? But try doing it from maybe the pontoon to start with, and it's something we do on our courses and see how easy it is to raise somebody and get somebody back on board. Lots of different methods, I'm not going to discuss these here, but again, something to go and practice. Think about your procedure for abandoning ship. Think about the procedure for fire or flood. What's your procedure for losing steering? We touched on that earlier. What would you do? How would you cope? How is your steering system set up? And what's your procedure for setting up a tow? Uh, maybe you haven't done that for a few years. Or shortening sails and rigging storm sails. But don't just do it during the day. Go out there and maybe do some night sailing and then get the crew to go and try and rig a storm sail at night um, and to see how it goes. Um, it's just pushing the boundaries a little bit beyond what we do on the coastal sailing. So it's quite a lot. Hopefully I've made you sort of think a little bit outside the box and some of the different areas that you need to consider. The good news is there's an awful lot of training available to help with all of this. And the key thing with the training courses is, unlike here where I'm just lecturing, if you like, it's a one-way communication. When we do the training, it tends to be small groups of eight people or so, and it's a really good opportunity to also have a chat with the other people in the room. When we teach an ISAF safety course, for example, more often than not, we've got people on the course who have had a lot of these experiences, who so we've had somebody that's had a, we've had people that have had most things happen to them, but you know, a dismasting or have lost their steering. And every situation is different, so a great part of the course is listening and learning to all the other participants and gleaning information from them. Um, but the ISAF safety course is probably a good starting point, and it's recommended by World Cruising Club. And in the UK, it's a one-day ISAF course, plus, if you want the ticket, you'll then need, need to do something called the RYA Sea Survival course. In Europe, it just tends to be a two-day course, because they don't have a sea survival course. So looking at the one-day part of the ISAF course, uh, that will cover really preparation, so very much what we're talking about today. That will cover what sort of equipment you need for an offshore passage. It's based on, for those that have raced, the ISAF special rigs, as you'd expect. So those that have done races like the Fastnet and so on, be quite familiar with some of the equipment requirements. We'll also look though at damage control and repair, loss of steering, dismasting, flooding, grounding. Uh, we'll look at fire precautions and extinguishers, what type of extinguishers you need. And we'll actually go outside and set some extinguishers off. So we try and make it as hands-on as possible. 
There'll be a flare demonstration and you can get your hands on some flares and let them off as well, which is always good fun. We'll discuss handling heavy weather. Um, I have to say, because of the way World Cruising Club set these rallies up, you rarely encounter heavy weather. There tends to be trade wind routes. But at some point, particularly on the world art, you will have some heavier weather. So we do discuss use of heavy weather sails, storm sails and droves if you have those on board. We'll discuss man overboard and we'll actually go down to the boat and use lots of different types of recovery equipment um, from the pontoon and give you a chance to try and recover somebody on board. And um, we'll go and while we're there, we'll set some storm sails up. The second day is the RWA Sea Survival course. Um, has anybody here done the Sea Survival? You, you, yeah, good fun course. It's, you know, it is, although it's a serious message, it's great fun. You'll spend two hours of it in the swimming pool. Um, really learning what it's like to try and get into a life raft from the sea and then you'll be wishing you're never going to be in that position ever again. It does teach you to stay on the boat unless it really is about to sink under your feet or it's ablaze. Don't get into the life raft. But we will talk about different types of raft, um, different types of life jackets. We'll talk about grab bags, what makes a good grab bag, what to take with you and then we'll talk about the launch procedure. Moving on we'll discuss the initial actions in a life raft what to do once you've done that, what we term secondary actions. We'll talk about water and food rationing, long-term survival. Hopefully none of you guys will be in that situation. And also what to expect when you come to be rescued by a lifeboat or a helicopter. Um, there's a little bit also on survival without a life raft. As you can imagine, you hope, you know, hopefully none of you will be in that situation, but we do cover that as well. I guess the other um, safety related issue when we're sailing offshore and one that prompts you to think about training is the, is the need um, for, for some first aid training and you know, the independence of offshore training, offshore sailing does mean that we don't have ready access to a good healthcare system. Now that doesn't mean that we have to go and equip our boats to be a general hospital and in actual fact it's probably not a good idea to have every drug under the sun on the yacht, unless you are a doctor and know how to use all these things. It can sometimes cause more problems than it solves. But we do need to think about what level of training we need and what level of equipment we need. And the way to approach this is to do a bit of a risk assessment. Think about the level of previous knowledge you have on board. A lot of doctors, we get a huge number of doctors come on sailing courses for some reason, so there's a lot of doctors anyhow, and certainly in the ARC fleet, our experience is there always seems to be lots of doctors sailing, which is great. But do bear in mind, you know, if it's a senior surgeon, the last time they did first aid might have been 25 years ago when they were doing their training. So again, you may want to think about what sort of experience you have on board, what was their most recent experience of first aid. What type of voyage you're doing, how far from land you'll be voyaging, um, whether backup support is nearby and the size of the vessel and storage. I've touched on you know, the amount of equipment you can potentially get. On a commercial yacht that's venturing worldwide, as a, something called a Cat Zero yacht, um, they have to have what's called Category A medical supplies and that involves taking a stretcher and oxygen tanks and you know, it does get quite difficult to store all of this. But again, have a think about how much room you have on board. The type of injuries you need to consider, most typically when we're offshore sailing, we tend to get soft tissue injuries, um, eye injuries, just little bits going into the eye. Burns, unfortunately, can be quite common, particularly from the galley. Jeremy mentioned the rolling that we have going downwind, and there have been previous cases of people getting burns on the arc. So again, prevention is better than cure, isn't it, in terms of wearing foul weather gear and so on. Um, but it does happen. So think about what you're going to have in your first aid kit for that. Seasickness, possibly, and the other thing that's quite common is physical trauma such as laceration from lines and anchors and so on, and then the problem then is preventing infection once that happens. So in terms of training to try and help you with some of these problems, um, the most basic level of training is the RWA first aid course, that's a one day course, and it is a basic course, it, it is going to give you an introduction to basic first aid, but it will cover some of the key things such as um, burns, shock, uh, heart attacks, CPR and so on and also drowning um, so all the basic things in there but what I would say guys is if you're thinking of perhaps going outside of the arc and certainly doing something like the world arc you really should unless you have previous medical experience consider doing a longer course and there are two courses that are designed for professional uh, crew both on professional yachts and also on big merchant vessels as well 
And we run these courses at Humble School of Yachting. Um, the first one is the first aid aboard ship course, and the second one is the medical care aboard ship course. And whilst these are designed for all users, including merchant vessels, our instructor who we use is a lady who has sailed all her life, but has also spent most of her life, and when she's not sailing, working in A&E units in various hospitals around the UK. So have a look carefully wherever you go and ask who the instructor is and what their background is to your, your experience as a sailor. That's quite important. Um, the difference between the two courses, well the first day aboard ship course is four days. And the idea of that is to give you a little bit more advanced knowledge than the one day course. So it will primarily still be first aid, but it'll certainly be a lot more advanced and it will look at things like suturing. The second course, a medical care aboard ship course, is five days and you do have to done the first one first. You need to do the first day before the medical care, so it's nine days in total. Medical care really does move on and look at some more advanced uh, medical situations involving um, catheterization, for example, minor surgery, uh, but long-term care of somebody that is quite poorly and crucially will teach you how to talk to a doctor ashore and how to communicate the symptoms and so on okay and use your advanced medical kit that you might have on an offshore uh, blue water boat so quite an involved course but well worth it for people that are looking at long-term cruising now what are the other reasons that's really i guess the safety side of things one of the other reasons people undertake training, and that I mentioned earlier, is self-reliance. We do need to be able to fix things ourselves. And I touched on the fact you're going to need to know your yachts and your systems far more intimately than perhaps we do if we're only coastal sailing. Um, before you go, I think it's important, you know, try and get involved with routine maintenance on your yacht. I know many of you will, but if you do subcontract a lot of it to a yard, maybe initially try and work with the yard if you're allowed to and see how they maintain your boat. But as many jobs as possible, do yourself. So get involved with servicing your winches. Find out what spare parts you need for your winches. Believe me, those little pulls that ping over the side when you service your winch can be quite hard to get hold of in the middle of nowhere. So go and do that. Um, get a rigger down to do a rig check on your boat and get him or her to show you the key things that you need to keep an eye on, but also what the key early indicators are of a rig failure. And that can be something as small as a slight strand on the swage terminal starting to rise up. It can be an early indication that something's about to give. But a day with a rigger, or even a half day, will be money well worth spent. Rigging takes a huge amount of punishment on a downwind trip. Um, learn how to service your engine, um, but also what spare parts you need. Again, things like thermostats um, and so on can be quite hard to source in certain remote parts of the world. So build up a good tool kit and a good spares kit and learn what you need. Understand your plumbing system, and particularly your heads. Understand those intimately. They can become a problem offshore. Um, get to know every nook and cranny on your boat. I think, you know, I'm quite surprised even now on the ARC safety inspection sometimes when I ask people what type of steering system they have, and they're not sure. And then I say, well, let's have a look at the quadrant, and they don't know where the steering system is. And they've already sailed all the way down from the UK. So really get into all those lockers, find out where every cable is, every seacock is, every cable conduit is and so on. Really get to know your boat. Now again, the good news, there is some training to help you with all of this. We, we do run a seven day yacht maintenance training course. And the idea of this course is to give you a brief overview of each of the key areas that you're likely to have to get involved with in terms of maintenance. You won't be a boat builder after seven days. Um, that takes many years. But it will give you some really good basic tools um, to help you and some knowledge to help you overcome the key problems you like to encounter but also some regular maintenance tips as well and those seven, over those seven days you'll look at 12 volt electrics and uh, you'll spend a full day looking at the wiring system on the boat what tools you need to um, uh, repair problems the chap that teaches this is a test engineer for Ray Marine as well so he's phenomenally knowledgeable on electronic systems so any questions you've got on that side of things as well he can really help you with You'll spend a half day on looking at plumbing, uh, a full day with Jerry the Rigger, who's actually the ARC Rigger, and he will really give you a heads up on some of the things I mentioned earlier on rigging. You'll spend a day with Angie, who's a sailmaker, and uh, she'll really give you again a heads up on how to look after your sails, how to, what sort of sails you should be looking for when you purchase sails, maybe for a long voyage, but how to repair them, how to maintain them. And again, you'll get hands on. All oh, this is very hands on. You'll be sewing, you'll be climbing the rigs, it's all very hands-on. 
You'll spend uh, two days looking at GRP skills, so we'll teach you how to start repairing your own dents, how to look after GRP, how to polish it, also antifail and how to varnish. And then you'll spend a day and a half on diesel engines. And again, it's all very hands-on, so once we've covered the basic theory, we'll be taking parts off of the engine and putting forks into the engine and getting you guys to fix the forks based on what you've learned. So it's very, very hands-on. Um, a couple of other quick courses uh, you may want to consider. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, in terms of navigation, you may want to understand how to use a sextant. So there's a couple of courses. The Coastal Yachtmaster Theory course isn't Astro Nav. That is just traditional nav. But if you're feeling rusty on your traditional nav, that might be a good one to consider. Um, but the RYA Ocean Theory course, which is five days in the classroom, will teach you how to use a sextant. But it also, a large part of the course now is looking at planning for an ocean passage. So it will discuss um, power consumption, weather, routing, uh, vittling, um, and all the other factors. So it isn't just how to use a sextant, it's an all-round package, this course. But I'd probably say, because of the nature of the subject, 75% of it, 70 percent of it will be uh, celestial navigation. Okay. Radar course, for those that are a little bit rusty with the radar, great bit of kit to have on board, particularly to spot the squalls which uh, sudden rainstorms, and for those that have seen them before, you can see them on a radar quite clearly, it's quite useful. Jeremy mentioned earlier that the weather um, influences when rallies take, um, take place. And, you know, certainly with the arc, Jeremy mentioned that, um, you know, the trade winds are developing around about late November. And one of the reasons for that is we've got the high pressure of the Azores starts to sink down a little bit and create a nice steady band of trade winds south of Gran Canaria, between Gran Canaria um, and the Cape Verdes. Um, at the same time, that allows low pressures to zip across the top of it and hit us in the United Kingdom, which is why it's a good time to get away. Um, it's an amazing subject, worldwide weather, and because of the amount of requests we've had, we've teamed up with Chris Tibbs, who I'd probably say is the UK's most experienced meteorologist in terms, in terms of the sailing world. He has sailed well in excess of half a million miles. He's um, campaigned various Volvo races, been tactician for various high-end races, and was also tactician for the uh, Swiss Olympic team um, in the last Olympics. And he's actually a thoroughly nice guy as well to boot. He's a fantastic off offshore sailor. So aside from weather, um, he's got an absolute mine of information. And I think Jeremy, Jeremy is lucky enough to be sailing across the Atlantic with him this year. Um, so we've managed to get him over, he's a hard man to get hold of and do a two-day weather course. And he will, on that, those two days, go through some of the things we've touched on and Jeremy's touched on in terms of worldwide weather and routing. And he'll be looking at global circulations, air masses, isobar charts, weather dangers, tropical weather, ocean weather, coastal weather, looking at grid files, how to get grid files, how to interpret them, how they work. We'll also discuss ocean currents and, and weather routing. And he's also available for private routing if, if you want it as well. Another couple of courses you may want to consider. Uh, sail trim. Um, there's an awful lot of downwind sailing on most of these rallies. And in the UK, we don't seem to get... We all seem to be going upwind around these parts, don't we, and beating into it. But you will find you'll be doing a lot more nice downwind stuff. But that does then pose the problem how to set my boat up for that type of sailing. Um, so come along, come and do a cell trim day, and we'll go and get the spinnaker out, we'll put the pole out, and we'll look at some downwind rigs, we'll pole out head sails, and we'll look at basic cell trim as well, so that's a one day course. Um, and we also do a one day course in boat handling as well. That's about it, I'm, I hope I haven't, the first part didn't scare you too much, the, the statistics are, it is unbelievably safe. Um, all I really want to do is try and sort of prick your conscience a little bit, and maybe get you thinking, even if you are extremely knowledgeable, is there any other bits that perhaps I could brush up on, or perhaps I could learn? And as I touched on earlier, once you've got that training, you really enjoy it. And the people in Las Palmas that I see who have done the training, done the preparation, are relaxed. They have a fantastic trip and there's a lot less apprehension, they really enjoy themselves. So uh, that's me done. I wish, if you are doing any of the events, I wish you a great time, very jealous, enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, just to recap on that, um, uh, being prepared and being ready, the, the most relaxed guy I've ever seen doing the art was an American skipper and his wife, eight years ago now, 
Um, they were the first people on the queue for check-in when we opened the rally office and he sat there and I went through the program with him and told him about the parties and things. He said, yeah, we'll go to that one, we'll go to that one, we'll go to that one. And I said, you're going to have time to do all this. He said, yeah, we, we've been here four weeks, everything's done on the boat, all we need to do is put the food on um, two days before we go and we're, and we're ready. And he was so prepared and so relaxed. He had a most amazing time um, because his boat was ready. And the key thing is if you look after your boat, um, and, and put the effort into your boat, you'll have a, a great time sailing it and enjoying it, which is really what we want to do. The boat is a way of getting us to these lovely places. Um, before we break, I'd just like to introduce Thomas Vibrance, who's uh, snuck in at the back there wearing the red shirt. Um, Thomas is our uh, catamaran expert. So people who want to learn about uh, sailing with two hulls, two boats, um, Thomas is great to talk to on that. He's also our downwind expert so he can tell you everything you want to know about um, different patterns uh, and different downwind rigs. So um, great to have you with us, Thomas. He's going to be on our panel tomorrow as well. Um, we're going to take a comfort break now, uh, grab a cup of coffee and uh, refresh yourselves. Um, it's 20 past 11, so we'll say uh, reconvene by those who want to come and watch the safety walkthrough on low profile. Um, we'll reconvene in uh, 20 minutes, so uh, 22, 12. Um, we're going to do it on uh, the dock between C and E dock. So you can stand on the wall to watch the boat, or we can go onto the dock. You probably have a better view from on the wall, actually. If you spread yourselves around, um, we'll, we'll kick off in about 20 minutes down by low profile. Thank you.